All right, welcome in to Carp's Corner. And we've got some stuff going on in college football and collectives. We've talked a lot about them. We've talked a lot about NIL deals and how that's impacting recruiting, how that's impacting um, disbursement of talent throughout the college football landscape. We've gotten in to the situation with Jimbo Fisher and Nick Saban. They've kind of squashed that at SCC meetings. You know, you've heard Lane Kiffin kick his stuff in about it being basically a semi-pro NFL league now, NFL light, if you will, college football ultimately becoming that. So we've gotten to that. And a lot of coaches have alluded to this, and they've talked about it. And Nick Saban said, check how much money our guys have made. They've done it the right way. They're making all this cash at Alabama. You know, there's the rumors of obviously the stuff that went on at AM and how the collectives are helping to pay and, and handle all that. And you know, the the blogger, the guy, you know, social media dude, slice bread coming in and Jimbo Fisher talking about him and everything that goes on with that. But nobody's really put firm numbers on it outside of the dude named Slice Bread. No one has really talked exactly what the dollar amounts are going to look like to be able to put together elite classes, to be able to say, hey, we want to be one of the top five programs in all college football. To do that, what do we ultimately need to do? How much money do we need to bring in as a collective? Then we're making sure we're issuing out you know, to players as they come through. What do our NIL deals need to look like? How much cash do they ultimately need to be to have in there? And so no one has really put exact dollar amounts on it. They just talk about maximizing the potential of their players and making sure they're doing it in a responsible manner. And I understand why the coaches are doing that, and I respect them for it. But someone's eventually got to put a number on it. And so Ryan Day and Gene Smith did that. They talk about what the overarching number is going to be. Ryan also talked you know, a little bit about what the going rate is going to be for top tier two QBs, break it down a little bit by position. And then Jim Harbaugh has some comments about what he thinks the value proposition is at Michigan. And I'm not sitting here, I've talked about this many times, to sit here and say that I think education isn't valuable. The lessons learned in college aren't valuable. The development of young men, hopefully into fully formed men when they leave college, that's, that all has value. The bigger part is there's a lot more value that, this, that the players are now providing the university with all the dollars that come in via the ticket revenue and then ultimately the TV deals and these multimedia deals that are driving all of this. And so with that being said, like I understand that there's a value proposition that's greater than just the dollar amount. And coming from a guy that didn't get any money to play football outside of his scholarship, I think that, that was greatly important and critical to my development as a young man. And so we're going to get into those topics during the show today. Gene Smith and Ryan Day's comments. We're going to talk Jim Harbaugh, what he thinks the value proposition is. And is Michigan, who many people would say is right there with Ohio State for the last 50 years, have been driving the bus in the Big Ten, even though the last 20, maybe not as much, had a big win this year, won the Big Ten, went to the college football playoff for the first time. And so you would think that Michigan get a little chesty and would be leaning in to this situation, trying to take NIL and utilize it and help stimulate their program and build upon last year's success. Some schools get it. Some schools don't. Down in the SEC, everybody's getting together. I look around the Big Ten, and you're trying to figure out who else would really want to compete on a national level like Ohio State. You ask yourself that. In the Big Ten, who ultimately would want to compete on a national level and ultimately do what it takes? Ohio State, I think we know that. They spend money on facilities. They spend money on coaches. They're working on NIL deals for their players. Penn State, you could say, they paid James Franklin a lot. Now, you can say whether or not that was a good idea or a bad idea, but Penn State has beaten Ohio State. They have, they've invested in facilities. You know, Happy Valley is kind of secluded in the middle of PA, but they do have access. A little bit of the Pittsburgh market, but a lot of the East Coast market, especially with Philadelphia, they get a lot of players from there. And so there's access with a lot of Penn State alums. 
so there's that element of it. That's a big piece. Nebraska, I think they care a lot. I think they would raise money. I think they would do everything they could. They have elite facilities. They paid Scott Frost. They're not really in a position where they've had a lot of success over the last seven to 10 years. I think Nebraska could do it. Michigan State has paid a lot of uh, Mel Tucker a ton. They're trying to invest in facilities. They're trying to invest. The Big Ten's getting all this cash. And so it seems like those teams are there. And it seems like Michigan would be right there with Ohio State on the forefront of that. And Jim Harbaugh says some things that would lead you to believe that they're not there. Like Iowa, you could argue. Maybe Minnesota in the Twin Rivers area. But like you start looking at some of the big dogs across the Big Ten, Wisconsin and Madison, I think they would do it some. You know, the city, they could probably get behind it. They care about football a lot, but probably not on an elite and national level. You're talking Ohio State, Penn State, should be Michigan, maybe a Michigan State. Nebraska, I think, has a desire to do it, but I don't know if they've had the success where it would translate immediately. So we'll dive into all of that. And then also, someone you know reached out. I love the comments that everybody makes. So folks, listen, subscribe, share, comment, ask questions. I can get you to this. You know, Nick Mangold, former Ohio State Buckeye, teammate of mine, multi-time, Pro Bowl or All Pro, center for the Jets. Him, DeBrickashaw Ferguson, and uh, and Revis Island, Darrell Revis, are all going into the Jets' ring of honor. And so I'll tell some stories, talk a little bit about Nick and what it meant to play with him. And a good friend of mine, we're in each other's weddings and everything else. But starting off, the story of the day, and I'll throw this up here. Um, starting off, said, Day and the Buckeyes athletic director, Gene Smith, told business leaders in Columbus that they'll need $13 million in NIL money just to keep their roster intact, according to Cleveland.com. Day believes the total would include money generated through collectives that have been created since the NFL policies went into place. Day went on to say, one phone call and their players are out the door. We cannot let that happen at Ohio State. I'm not trying to sound the alarm. I'm just trying to be transparent about what we're dealing with. And so here's what happened. Ryan Day and Gene Smith spoke at a you know, business luncheon in Columbus, Ohio. And the topic of NIL probably came up. Maybe he talked about it unsolicited. Maybe this was him trying to get some people going, saying, hey, we got to raise money for these collectives. You know, Cohesion's a big one that just got founded. Um, you know, working with IMG, they've got branding and trademarks. They've got a great partnership with nonprofits. I know a lot of the people that are involved, really good people doing it the right way. But they're trying to get money to players. When you go and recruit now for Ohio State, I don't know if you have to beat everybody dollar for dollar across the ACC, SEC, national landscape, but you have to be in the same ballpark. The value proposition can also be, hey, you can come to Ohio State. We're going to develop you for the NFL. That's the long dollars. Those are the big dollars. But you can also get good money while you're here. Our collectives will take care of you. If you become a great player at a skill position, starter, big name, you're going to be able to earn a lot of cash. Columbus is a big city. And so you don't necessarily need to say, hey, we'll get you five grand more, 20 grand or whatever it is. I don't think people are going to be looking at it that close on the margins. But you got to be in the ballpark. Someone can't say hey, everybody that comes to Texas A&M, for example, gets $50,000, especially offensive linemen, probably not a sexy position, not going to get a ton of NIL deals. You're going to get guaranteed that every year. Ohio State, you're, going to, you're not going to be able to beat guys who are doing that. That's why Nick Saban was complaining. You might not need to give them 50, but maybe you need to give them 30 to 35 per year and say, hey, we develop guys at a high level. We'll do you right, and we'll make sure and make certain – that you become the best player you can be. And so we have to have table stakes to get in the game, though. You can't just say we're not going to ante up. Everybody now in recruiting has to hit the ante. And it's a big deal. It's changed dramatically. That was never the case until NIL stuff came along. And now this is when things are changing. And so that's Ryan Day and Gene Smith, the athletic director of Ohio State. So it wasn't like Ryan was speaking out of turn. It wasn't like he went off on a tangent. You know, said some things he didn't mean. His athletic director was there. It was in the middle of the day. 
It wasn't like he was intoxicated, making bad decisions at some group that he's you know talking and off the cuff and didn't know what he was saying. He knew exactly what he was saying. Ryan Day was telling everybody, we need to raise money to be able to get in the game. And we'll win the recruiting battles, but people are going to call our players, hey, what's your NIL situation? How much are you making? Oh, I'm not making anything? Okay, why don't you come here? You can play for us, and we'll be able to get you X. One phone call, he said, and the players are out the door. We can't let that happen at Ohio State. Not trying to sound the alarm. Just trying to be transparent about what we're dealing with, said Ryan Day. He also went on to say, in my good buddy Jay Book, uh, went to school with my lovely wife, of course with Ohio native. Some of the more information leaked out. He breaks it out, so we'll, we'll throw this up here. So Ryan Day was openly speaking about the going rate for elite talent. So obviously during this, Ryan broke it down a little more. Top-tier QBs, they're going to get $2 million in NIL money. Elite edge rusher, they're getting a million bucks. Top offensive tackles, they're getting a million dollars. They said if you're not in the game when the players ask, you're done. And so what that's telling me, players are coming in. Coach, what can you do for us? We love it here. We want to come here. We think you'll develop us. But I can't turn down a half a million dollars somewhere else if you're not going to give me anything. You got to be close. You got to be in the game. And so that's what Ryan is getting in these questions now. And they're putting together elite recruiting classes. They got Dylan Rayola coming in, top-ranked quarterback in 2024. But people are asking, get these elite receivers, Emeka Ibuka, Julian Fleming, Marvin Harrison Jr., Jackson Smith, and Jigman, all these guys. Like, people want to come. They know they're going to get developed. They'll turn into Chris Olave. They'll turn into Garrett Wilson. They'll be elite draft picks. But – you got to be able to help them out while they're there. And this is the first time dollars have been actively tagged to players, positions, and then on an aggregate of what you're going to need each and every year. Now, conversely with that, Jim Harbaugh up at Michigan had some things to say. And if you're a Michigan fan who loves football there and feels like it's serious and it's big time, and this might be a little bit disheartening for you. And it's disheartening for me as a fan of the big 10 and understanding what Michigan has been historically, the players that they've had, how they've desired to compete and go win and win big 10 titles and recruit on a national level. So we'll throw this up here. Take a look, Jim Harbaugh on NIL impacting recruiting. I don't know how much or really I have an opinion on that right or wrong. Our philosophy is that coming to the University of Michigan is still going to be a transformational experience rather than a transactional experience. I agree with Jim Harbaugh on that. It was on with the next question. How much he hears about NIL while recruiting? I hear a lot. You hear a lot about it. It's talked about a lot. I just don't know how much is real, how much is accurate. Is it accurate or not? It's like a fishtail which we all know how those go and those can grow fishtail stories. So I hear a lot. I don't know how much is real or accurate. And so what Jim Harbaugh is basically saying there, everybody's asking about it now. Maybe he feels like players are bluffing. They're throwing out numbers and he's probably, if you're not having your, your ear to the track and understand exactly what's happening and where this is going, I could understand that. You might say, geez, this is crazy. I talk to people all the time. Can't believe it. These are the dollars that would be thrown out for college football. But everybody's talking about it. They're having meetings with the coaches' meetings in Destin, Florida, about it for the SEC right now. Ryan Day's talking about it at luncheons. And Jim Harbaugh, who just went to the college football playoff, he beat Ohio State. He won the Big Ten for the first time in about 20 years for Michigan. And he's sitting here saying that I don't really have an opinion on it. Michigan's going to be a transformational experience. It might be that. And that's all true. But there's another lane that you also have to, another box you got to check. You got to make sure if you want to compete that you're, you're hitting the table stakes. And that's what I'm saying with this. And people get upset. And the responses to this on Twitter have been crazy. You know, first of all, ignorance out there talking about 
this will be shut down as soon as Title IX gets involved. If you go look at the top earners from NIL, a number of them are female athletes across the variety of sports. This is good for women too. This is good for the ladies that are playing in college athletics. Title IX ain't going to change any of this. This is private dollars that are being given to players. It isn't public money. And it's been, there's some equitable levels of it where there's high earning women. So it's not like it's all going to just the football players. But some of the other comments, like I'm done with college football, maybe you are. Maybe it's turning into NFL light. I know there's still the rivalries. There's still the tradition. If you have a problem with players earning revenue based upon their name, image, and likeness, based upon going and marketing themselves, something that any other student can do. If they have an elite skill set, scientist, pianist, violinist, you pick something. They can go out there and they can earn a living and they can be represented and they can market themselves and make cash off of it. Athletics was the only place you couldn't utilize your skill set outside of the realm of amateurism. I'm not talking about getting paid by the school. We're talking about outside dollars coming in. And so, so many people are so upset about it. Ryan Day and Gene Smith, this is what it's going to be. And the 13 million a year to keep your team intact. And then talking about exactly what it's going to be position by position for elite talent. First coach to do that. And I think you're probably going to see other coaches now at the elite schools start to talk about it because they know they need to raise the money. And the only way they can raise the money is by going out and telling people exactly what they need and what will happen if it's not raised. Maybe some people don't like it. They don't like where college football is going and maybe they don't watch as much. And if you don't watch as much, the marketing dollars will go down for television, their broadcast partners, and they won't have as much to spend on coaches and facilities. But right now the big 10 is booming. The sec is booming. They're going to be getting between 80 and a hundred million dollars per school on these TV and multimedia deals. When you factor in bowl games and everything else, I mean, we're talking a billion dollars to a conference plus broken up among all the schools it's different may not like it but it's here to stay i'm gonna close with this my man nick mangold darrell Rivas, the brickishaw ferguson nick and the brickishaw were drafted in the same draft that i was in 20 uh 2006 nick became a great center there he was a great center here it's a great wrestler in high school room with aj both guys are from centerville nick went to kettering altar nick was my dude man it's Memorial Tournament weekend. One of my great stories. I mean, Nick went up there and we, we'd overserve ourselves a little bit. And uh, Nick disappeared. I have no idea how he got home. We found him just passed out, no shirt on, laying on the, laying on the couch. And we walked in. Uh, we didn't draw all over him like we did Schlegs. But he was a good time, man. Nick was one of my dudes who I'd always be able to go out with. He'd go down to OU. His girlfriend, now wife, was a DG down there. We'd go down and... Uh, hang out, all my high school buddies. But Nick was a great roadmate, great player in the league. And, you know, funny story that he told me, and I, I think he's told this publicly, so he wouldn't care. Hurts his foot. You know, the Jets release him at the end of his career. And this is what happens to a lot of guys. And you're rehabbing an injury, and now you're not really part of a team. Do you want to play? He talks to an agent, his agent. You know, Nick, do you want to go play? Yeah, there's some interest. Well, you know, there's a team that's interested in you. You know, what do you want? What type of deal? All right, Nick, you know, it's rehab. He's like, I'll take a one year. How much do you want? And Nick goes, I threw out a number that I thought there's no way they'd say yes. And truth be told, my agent kind of laughed at me and said, I don't even know if I can take that to him. He goes, take it to him. Takes it to the team. The team kind of scoffs a little bit. Comes back to Nick a week later. You know what, Nick? They initially balked but they said they'll pay you the money. I can't believe it. I cannot believe they're going to agree to pay you this much. And with where you're at coming off an injury, being an older player. And Nick's like, then he got real. And he's like, well, give me a little bit to think about it. His agent's like, what? You're the one that put the number. It wasn't like, this is an offer to you. You put it out there to them and they accepted it. Now you need to think about it. And Nick goes sitting there realizing now it just got real. I wasn't just rehabbing my foot to kind of become a normal dude again, be able to walk around and be a dad. I was rehabbing to go play. He's like, I realized I couldn't do it. 
psychologically, I could not get there. And so his agent negotiated a deal that they accepted that he put out there for him and didn't take, didn't take it all. And, uh, gosh, it was funny listening to that from him. One of my good friends, we were in his wedding. He was in ours, um, party times all the time. He is a good, Nick is a good time. Charlie, one of my best buds and really happy for him to be going into the jets ring of honor. It's an honor. Well-deserved. It's very fitting for him. And I'm really, really happy to see this happen for my guy, Nick. So congratulations, Nick Mangold. Congratulations to Brickshaw. We all came out together. Darrell Revis, you know, out of Pittsburgh, out of the quip as well going in all those guys, very worthy and very deserving. So congratulations um, to them. And I might sprinkle some other Nick stories in throughout the rest of the shows over the next few weeks. Don't want to dump them all to you too early, but congratulations, Nick. And so that ends this edition of Carp's Corner. Appreciate you tuning in. We've got the Memorial Tournament here in Columbus, Ohio. The weather has been great. Been working on my tan. Excited to spend the weekend out there. So enjoy it, folks. Summer is officially here, especially in the Midwest. It's getting nice. So enjoy yourselves. Continue to like, subscribe to this, share it with your friends, throw me some comments, anything you need. I'm always here to help and answer your questions. We'll get Ohio State tuned up and to hopefully find out some more information about what Ryan Day is saying and uh, more details about that. Until next time, have a good one.